Amen. So here we are to worship, to worship a wonderful God. And uh, so far, the service has been absolutely fantastic, and I hope I don't mess that up uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, I want to say uh, to Jeff Malani, what a wonderful, fantastic, vulnerable moment that you guys shared and you ministered to all of our hearts. And um, I remember when Lilani uh, got baptized into Christ, and I remember when Jeff came from Vancouver to Toronto uh, many, many years ago. And I can say this with the deepest sincerity that I've ever felt. I have never felt more respect for you guys than I did a few minutes ago. Thank you for being such humble servants and our people who are willing to serve God and fight for your relationship with God to the nth degree. That was truly an inspiration to all of us. Thank you again. I can say this, one of the things that we want to do here in the Ottawa Church is to be able to be blessed and encouraged by people who are visiting. And so uh, Jeff and Lalani and Jerrica and their kids came and, and we wanted you guys to experience them a little bit. And so we thank you for doing that. Um, coming to worship this morning was very similar when I went to worship last week. Um, as most of you may know, um, I was in Miami last week. And uh, because the third child in my family, the oldest, but the third child got married. And we now, in the last 13 months, have three children all being married. We're both busy and broke. And, um, and so we're very excited about that. But there's no broke, brokenness and being broke, so to speak, uh, not having money. That is good as what that felt. And being... Being as old as I am, and there are a lot of things in your life. Well, I don't know why people chuckle. Uh, You're not I'm not. Uh, oh, I don't usually admit. Uh, is that right, Sean? I'm not old. I'm not old. Okay, I am 52 years old. Um, and but you, you know, you never realize that there are times in your life that you really feel something that is truly, truly a milestone in your life. I imagine it. But when uh, uh, my son and now daughter um, uh, got married, it was just an absolute uh, uh, euphoric mo uh, feeling that both Melly and I had. But I know I certainly experienced that, and it is just really, really fantastic. But coming to worship this morning was very similar like last week. This color scheme was a little different. The color scheme here is white, and the one there is green. And... Um, and uh, the attire was a little different. My clothes were a little heavier this morning, but other than that, it was about the same. And, uh, but it's, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as a great experience it was worshiping with the Miami church, there's nothing like being with your own family. And uh, while I was tempted, it was not to the really, really nth degree to stay there uh, any longer. No, I missed you guys, and I, I look forward to spending some time here together. The title of my sermon this morning is, That Was an Expensive Meal. No, I'm not talking about the dinner, the wedding dinner uh, at all. Uh, but there are a lot of times that you spend some money or you spend some things and you don't realize truly how expensive it was. I got to tell you this story. When Melanie and I got married 20, almost 28 years ago, that's a while ago, yeah. June, uh, uh, sorry, in May 16th, it will be 28 years we would have been married. Yeah, we, we were uh, married when we were children. Um, and uh, no, I just told you my age. That's right. All right. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so, on our first wedding anniversary, two lovely couples took, wanted to take us out to dinner. And so we actually had moved to Los Angeles at this time. And so we were right there on the Pacific Ocean, beautiful restaurant overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And, and we all just got married and we don't have the most money in the world. Um, and so we're sitting there we enjoyed this fantastic dinner. 
Some of you may know this couple. These couples are Robbins and the Bulkies. And so, and so we're having there, we're having dinner. And so at the end of the dinner, all the money that apparently they had was spent. And so they said, they look around and said, hey, um, can you help pay for parking? <laughs> And we all chuckle and laugh. You know, we were, we we're young married couples. Of course, we'll uh, help pay for parking. But we didn't realize how expensive the meal was. I mean, the idea of just taking out their friends and going out and enjoying uh, a, a, a wedding anniversary together was absolutely fantastic. And so we had a grand time. Yeah, but we didn't realize. I want to talk this morning about an expensive meal. That's not that we ate at that restaurant, but was incredibly expensive. So turn your Bibles to Genesis. Genesis chapter 25. The inspiration actually uh, of this lesson is partly due to the lesson that I heard when I was in Miami. And it really uh, helped me to understand as we're thinking about the idea of impact, I'm going to make it applicable to what we're trying to do here in the Ottawa Church. If you're visiting with us, one of the things that we want to do is to really be a people of impact. And because uh, whatever we do, sometimes we have a splash impact and the splash is very big, and sometimes there's a ripple effect impact, meaning that if you were to drop a rock in the water, you'll see a big splash, but also the ripple effect, and it goes out for a while. And the idea is, irrespective of who we are, we have impact. Sometimes it causes a splash, sometimes there's a ripple effect in our lives. And so the idea today that I want to talk about, sometimes it is a very positive impact that we have. Sometimes it's not so positive of an impact that we have. And prayerfully we can glean some lessons from ultimately God's word this morning to be able to realize what our actions and the impact that it has uh, on our own lives and ultimately on others. Because of the fact that we live our lives having an impact, we are then going to live our lives with intention. That there's an intentional way that we are going to, uh, our actions are going to show themselves. And so, in Genesis, we read about Abraham, and we read about him. Of course, we've talked about Abraham quite a bit. But Abraham, of course, was promised by God that he would be the father of all the nations. And so this promise, and of course, we remember the story well. Abraham said, hey, this is, that can't happen. Um, I am, I, my wife is barren, she can't have a child. God appeared to them when she was 90, he was 99, and said, hey, um, you're going to have a child. And she laughed. And, and she said, no, I didn't laugh. And, uh, it, it, uh, yes, you laughed. No, I did. Yes, you did. And of course, a year later, Isaac was born. Isaac then was then going to be uh, the person through whom God will bless Abraham. And as the scripture says, as he looked to the stars, there'll be as many children as the uh, stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And so we read this. Isaac now go get, he gets married to Rebecca. And they have a child. They were 60 years old. So we pick it up in Genesis chapter 25. And it says at the latter part of verse 26, Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The them there is referring to twins, a couple, a, a, a couple of boys by the name of Jacob and Esau. And so we read about them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. So here were these two guys who had significantly different dispositions on life. One of them just loved to go out hunting wild game, okay? That was his thing. And then some people just like to 
stay at home, learn, study, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, this morning, when we were driving in, Jerrica asked me, she said, have you guys gone skiing? I said, no, it's not my thing. That's not what I imagine. Like, if I were to imagine doing something, skiing is not one of them. <laughs> I like my legs in one piece, and visiting hospital is not an attractive thing to me. Some people, on the other hand, love to ski. And I say to you, may your God go with you. <laughs> but people do different things, right? I mean, I, I watch a sports program, and then I watch the replay and the highlights of the said program, not only once, but two or three times. And my wife comes and says to me, did you not just watch that game? And I said, yes, honey, but it's the highlights. But did you not just watch the entire game? Yes. Do you? It's the highlights. Do you not know the score and who won? Absolutely, but it's the highlights. <laughs> she can't understand it. And she said, I'll just go with it. Or when, she, when I sometimes listen or watch a sports program where two guys are arguing, and she walks in the room and she says, that's like, just like when the women argue, except these are guys and they're talking about sports. And, and, and so anyway, she, can't, she doesn't understand it. I said, that's all good. She sits and watches her Hallmark movies. <laughs> and I say, honey, I know exactly how this movie is going to play. <laughs> I've never seen it before in my life. And I am going to tell you exactly what happens. But watching the same movie over and over again, it's like watching the highlights, huh? <laughs> Esau came in and after a fantastic, probably, uh, day um, hunting and out in wild game, the Bible says something that sometimes we can, we can miss. And it says this, that he was famished. We'll get back to that. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? I mean, that sounds like a reason. Hey, if I'm going to die, being born, and when I was born, and the rights that come with that, what does that have to do with anything? Just give me some food. I am about to die. But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. We'll continue with this story, and then we'll tell the whole story, and then we'll, we'll come back to this again. So he sells his birthright. He sells, effectively, his inheritance. Well, what is the significant thing about being the oldest child, certainly in the Eastern culture? The significance is that you are going to receive a double portion of your inheritance, Ultimately, the reason why is became you now became the caretaker of that family, and you need the resources to be able to do that. And so that's one of the things that he gave up in effect, the inheritance that was due him. <coughs> we pick it up in chapter 27 in Genesis about this, the follow-up to this story. It says in verse 2, I am now, Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then get your equipment, he's speaking here to Esau, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt me some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, 
I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Another time we'll go through the depth, in-depth study of, of Jacob and Esau and all that kind of stuff that goes with that. But there's some lessons that we can learn here. Ultimately what Rebecca does, she helps Jacob and she prepares a meal for Jacob. He was the younger of the two sons. And so what happens, they actually had to concoct an incredible elaborate scheme to fool their father that indeed it was Esau. It was not Esau, but rather that it was Jacob. And so e Jacob was disguising himself to the point where Esau was so different that he was a hairy fella. And he put some goat skins on him so that when his father touched him, he would think that this guy was indeed hairy. And so when he came and approached Isaac, Isaac said, now it's weird, I know my eyes are not that great, but you sound like Jacob. But when he came and he smelled him, he put some stuff, not only the hair, he put some game, some of the animals on him, so he smelled like Esau, and he deceived him. And ultimately what happens is that Jacob received the blessing from his father, Isaac. So we pick it up. Isaac comes back, and he said um, in verse 18, so he says, this is an encounter with Jacob. He says, he went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son. He answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn, the deceit and the deception. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my games so that you may give me your blessing. And so there begins the deceit of Jacob to his father, Isaac. Isaac was a little smart when he pulled him close and he kissed him. That's when he smelled his clothes and he said, oh, this is my son. And he gave him the blessing. Verse 30. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father, his father Isaac asked him, who are you? I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him. And indeed, and indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Now, one of the best ways to interpret the scriptures is of course, let the scriptures interpret itself. In other words, one of the things we ought to do when we read about a story and it's referred to by other people in the scriptures, it's the best way to interpret what actually happened and how it's viewed by spiritual people and therefore ultimately the way that we ought to view it. So let's pick it up and see in the book of Hebrews that, uh, that um, what the writer of Hebrews says about this particular situation. Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this in verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I mean, that's, that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. Let's, yeah. let's live in peace with each other and 
let's be holy, in other words, let's make sure that we live a righteous life. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The idea here is that we have a responsibility to each other, that we see to it. That if I see to it in your life, that there's a responsibility that I have, that there's an involvement that I have. These are very good uh, thoughts about this. And then he goes on to say, see to it that no one is sexually immoral. Sexual immorality, we know, of course, the Bible teaches, uh, even by definition, that uh, any sex outside of marriage is actually uh, someone who is being unfaithful uh, to God. He says, or is godless like Esau. Now, it's weird. And we'll see the description in a second. Who, for a single meal, sold his inheritance rights as the oldest sufferer, as his oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. I gotta tell you, I gotta be honest with you, there's some struggle that I have with this. There's some struggles I have even theologically reconciling it in my mind. I'm not afraid of that. God will ultimately reveal. Not because you have questions, that doesn't mean you need to run from it, but there are some things and some lessons. God describes Esau as the godless man. I want you to understand that description. Godless. Without God. Sold is inheritance. Interesting, we too have an inheritance. The Bible tells us that when we become a disciple, there's an inheritance that awaits us. <laughs> and the writer of the book of Hebrews says, you got to be careful whether or not you are selling your inheritance. For a meal. One of the greatest things and one of the greatest challenges that we have is that Satan, our enemy, does not fight fair. As a matter of fact, any animal kingdom you see, the Bible describes Satan as a lion. Lions do not go after the strongest animal. As a matter of fact, no. He goes after the young and the weak ones. He has no shame. And he attacks and he kills. One of the things that I have noticed in my life and in people's life that I meet with, Satan loves to attack when we are weakened. The Bible says he sold his inheritance for a lentil soup when he was weak, hungry, and tired. So there's some lessons here. That there are moments in our lives when we are so vulnerable that we actually give up what has ultimately been promised to us for what is temporary and momentary. What somehow was in, would insatiate and fulfill something that is present. Let's talk about some of those things. When we are in a weakened state, there are a lot of times that we are vulnerable to temptations that come our way. 
When we are only attracted by what is in front of us, the lure of materialism, the lure of somehow, somewhere, thinking that if we were to get all the things that the Joneses have, that I too will be happy and subsequently we sell our inheritance and we yearn for these things that we think is going to fulfill my momentary challenges. And how many times in life do you see people say, let me get this part of my life all set up and then I'm going to entrust myself to God and ultimately we sell all inheritance for what is perhaps even expedient. Sometimes some of those things are relationships. Some of the plagues of Christian men and women are relationships that are ungodly and sometimes I've seen it more than I would like to share of people saying I am going to give up and I'm going to try and betray the principles that God has placed in the scriptures because I know I'm going to impact. I know this person seems so right for me. And ultimately sells their inheritance. It's an interesting thing. Jacob and his children did exactly what Jacob did. There's something about God that says sometimes some things that we do are generational. Yeah. Not because of necessarily punishing us, but for us to understand there are consequences to the way that we live our lives. It's not the end of the world. And I know I'm going to say some things that is perhaps going to ruffle your feathers a little bit. But as I've told you before, my goal here is not necessarily to make you feel great all the time, even though I'd like for you to feel great all the time, and I'd like for you to like me. I really would. But it's not the thing that drives me. I hope, at least hopefully not. But we're all human beings and we all want to be liked. That there are times that we have relationships, that we go to places that we know emotionally it's not good for us. I'll never forget in an interview with the President of the United States, one of the presidents, if you know the story, you know who I'm talking about. It doesn't matter who it is. But when he was interviewed and he had some indiscretions in his life, and the summation of what he said was, I was tired, it was late, and I gave in to my weakness. He was tired and he was late. I can't tell you how many disastrous decisions were made when we were tired and famished in our lives. And what seemed to be an expedient thing turned out to be the most expensive meal of his life. You, want to know, you know what the sobering thing was? He went, get this, with tears to go back to his father. He said, can you not give me a blessing too? 
Ultimately, he did, but not the same type of blessing. And the Bible tells us he did not have a chance to change. Wow! I struggle with that. I do. But that's what it says. That's what it says. Let me ask you a question. In the deep recesses of your heart where even you are scared to go, are you negotiating for the sale of your inheritance? Is there a price on it? Is it that your kids do well and you're willing to sacrifice the principles of God to be able to do that? Is there a job? Is there money? Is there a reputation? Is there negotiation? Is there somebody at your workplace that you know you're playing around with that you shouldn't? At a vulnerable moment, when you're famished, it is going to be so expedient and attractive that you will lose something that you value so much. You see, one of the things that is so right there in front of us that at times we don't realize that we are making a very bad trade. Let me tell you the impact that this had. The patriarchs of the scriptures are described how? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and who? Esau. Not Esau. This is how, they're called the patriarchs of the scriptures. You see how Esau is described? As a godless man. His inheritance was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But nowhere is it remotely mentioned in the scriptures. In posterity, in the view, So let me ask you a question. Let me show you the difference. When Jesus, Sean talked about this two weeks ago, I believe, a couple weeks ago, that the, when Jesus was walking through Jericho and he sat at Jacob's well, interesting whose well it was. It was not Esau's well, it was Jacob's well. well how does the Bible describe Jesus? He was what? Tired. And here was an opportunity for a woman who was not the necessarily most filled with fidelity. And yet his focus was not to flirt, so to speak, was on her soul. Jesus, when he, after 40 days of being in the desert, he was hungry. And what did Satan offer him? Some food. Unlike Esau, Jesus focused on the Word of God. Unlike Esau, when he was sitting at, not Esau's well, Jacob's well, Jesus was focused on someone's and the eternity on their life. Let me ask you a question. What is on your heart when you're talking with someone? Is it spiritual things? It's how we fight it. The impact that you and I are going to have are when our minds are so always in tune with what God wants and not what I want. Because if what I want is what drives me, I am telling you, we will go the way of Esau. 
and we'll lose our inheritance and be described as godless. Now that's scary. Come on, man. Is my goal to scare you? No. But that's what the text says. We got to wrestle with it. And sometimes we have this dynamic of this relationship with God. Anything goes. No. Esau sought with tears. That one I really struggle with. I don't know when that time is, but my whole goal with this lesson is that we will examine our lives and to ask ourselves some penetrating questions. Are there some times that you just, I mean, you know what Facebook has done for me? It is stunning to me. And I know, I'm not impervious to it, but it's stunning to me, people who call themselves believers and faithful, the things they write on Facebook. People that I thought, and it's like, are you serious? That there's not even a, a note, even an inkling of spirituality. That that is so compartmentalized in their life on a Sunday morning that everything else that describes them is a secular viewpoint and vantage point. Oh, I don't know. I, 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 have, I am in no position to judge your heart. Only you are. Expediency, being comfortable, it is stunning to me. 20% of the world uses 90% of the resources in this world. How can that sound right? Really, see, how can it sound right? We call ourselves Christians. I don't care what kind of political persuasion, but how does that sound right? We, who calls ourselves Christians at times, have the same goals. I don't know. I don't know what b- battle lurks in your heart, but I can tell you the impact of this expensive meal for Esau to the point where he is mentioned and described like this. And the patriarchs of the scriptures are Abraham, Isaac, and not Esau, but Jacob. And so the penetrating question for you now, hey, let me tell you what happens a lot in our lives. Right now, I can't do the spiritual thing. But I'm going to get myself ready. And I'm telling you I am. I'm going to get it ready. And when I'm ready, you're going to be the first one to call. That doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> There's some of us right now that are battling to hold on to the hurts. That's why I appreciate what Jeff Shades shares so much. How people have hurt us. And we were unwilling to let go, and it's eating at us. And bitterness is growing up. And some of us are going to miss the grace of God because of someone else's actions. Think about the stupidity of that. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that a bitter reed grows up. And so, 
This morning, it was intentional that we think not only about positive impact that we can have, but also what the negative impact. And think about your legacy and on your tombstone, what is going to be written. Abraham, Isaac, and what could have been. Thank you. Thanks for giving me your ear this morning. Well, that was great, amen. I also want to uh, thank uh, Jeff and Leilani uh, just for being uh, very, uh, very real, very transparent, and uh, in, in context of Tony's sermon, choosing your inheritance. And, uh, but uh, Tony, thank you very much. A lot to uh, chew on, literally. <laughs> a lot to digest. Perhaps it's, uh, I think it's a great follow-up, even thinking of the Samaritan woman and her thirsts. And Esau today, his hungers and, and the fact that he is famished. You know, I'm reminded that Satan will pay the price. He will, he, he will, he will try to quench our thirst and he will try to give things that will meet our, our, our hungers. And I'm also reminded today that I don't want to compromise in those areas. And I'm not naive. I'm not naive that those battles will come and have come, but I've got to choose an inheritance that is greater. I've got to make the right choices in the moment, not just at church, but the rest of, of our weeks and in the moments at work and at home, and not compromise and not to be godless, but to be righteous. I don't want to sell out. I have thirst like the Samaritan woman, but I want to, I want to have Jesus quench them. Amen. I have hungers like Esau, but I don't want to sell and give away my inheritance. Eternity, God is preparing an expensive meal. And you do not want to miss that one. So church, let's not sell out our inheritance. And I want it said that it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of me, and of you. Amen? Thank uh, Tony again for a great, incredible uh, sermon this morning. Before I go ahead and pray, I just want to remind us, uh, really opportunity, Tony and Melanie are going to be hosting uh, a uh, pre-teen and teen uh, little dinner together, or lunch together and talk about the direction of the youth and family, which is really, it, it's gonna be in this room? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, please uh, plan to stay for that. Really talking about the direction. This is a, is a hugely important ministry in the church. And we really wanna set ourselves up and, and kind of make some plans moving forward from here. So before we have one last song, let's go ahead and stand and I'll uh, close this, at least this part in a prayer and we'll finish with a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your faithfulness and vision for our lives. And there have been many times in our lives that we, we will sell out and we will take meals and, and go to places that we shouldn't. But Father, help us to have an eternal perspective. Thank you for, for, for Tony reminding us of that uh, through Esau. And help us not to sell our inheritance and our blessing to anyone. Father, help us to have this, this mindset and determination that you will continue to be our God, that we will want to spend eternity with you and not miss out on that incredible, incredible banquet. Please, uh, may, these, may this sermon and these words from your scripture move our hearts this week and every day of our lives. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's finish our service in a song.